Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Svetlana Rodenko. She is a concert pianist and educator, bringing a new feeling to the way in which sound, music and art are perceived and experienced in new media. She was awarded Doctor of Arts from the University of Granada, Spain. In addition, she had three years on a doctorate in the music performance program at Royal Irish Academy of Music, Dublin, Ireland, MMUs in performance from Conservatory of Music and Drama, Dublin Institute of Technology, PG Deep in Interactive Digital Media from School of Computer Science and Statistics, Trinity College, Dublin. And she is also a graduate of Tchaikovsky National Music Academy of Ukraine, Kiev. So, Dr. Rudenko, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much. And uh, nice to meet you, Ricardo. Um, right. Okay. So it seems that like I, uh, like my background as a concert pianist, uh, but then that so my uh, doctoral research on synesthesia and this while that so advances in technologies uh, of augmented reality and virtual reality given amazing opportunities for uh, development of um, musicology and their cognitive musicology and visualization of um, musical narrative and the music analysis um, uh, for classical music compositions and the, I'm very passionate uh, on this subject um, so yes <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, sure that's why I invited you on the show so uh, what do you do we know about music perception and cognition uh, right. Um, so, um, okay. A basic knowledge. Okay. Perception is the interpretation of our sensory infor of sensory information. Um, perception could be diversity, and particularly by studying and their um, current research on synesthesia, it shows that the, it's not always what we think. You know how we think another person actually experiences reality. So synesthesia is a peculiar uh, wiring of the brain um, where is the, the stimulus in one sensory modality could give reflection in another sensory modality. For example, sound could be perceived as vision or taste or smell or some sort of other feelings. And the uh, we are not always aware of this, um, that so the other person can experience actually absolutely different things. Even emotionally, we probably as human beings, we are connected and experience uh, similar, something similar, but there's much bigger diversity than we got used to. So uh, cognition, it's uh, knowledge, how we um, mental process of acquiring knowledge and the understanding that so the experience we have in. So there probably comes another link to consciousness and consciousness experience. And there, so there's a, a big discipline, it's scientific studies of consciousness, where um, scientists, neuroscientists and the psychology assesses um, three mental states it's uh, awakening sleep and the um, uh, vegetative states coma uh, medical condition so but now it's much bigger arguments for in um, opening the um, area to alternative states of consciousness uh, associated with music arts and meditation because certainly that our imagery world has very big power who we are and the what how we see our space our place in reality how we communicate as human beings and what dreams we want to perceive so and i think music and arts really given this um, opportunities to embrace the creativity of personality and the influence um, education and particularly growing generation of children um, to to be free as persons and the, to embrace a, a unique individuality and subjectivity so that you can proceed with next question I think I tried to you know to give the scoop yeah. 
So, uh, does music processing involve different kinds of cognitive mechanisms? Mm -hmm. So, uh, music listening or music performance, performing, um, it's an embodied um, experience because uh, we uh, live in reality and we perceive the world with uh, our sensory system. So, um, even music listening involves in associative processes, mental processes. So, if we experience something emotionally, then we would um, um, rely to our subjective experience and memories, what music brings, and there, there we experience empathy and their connectedness with the, um, with this experience of music. So. For performer, it's a bit uh, more experience because uh, the musician has to produce the sound. And of course, it involves um, tactile functions, uh, visual, vision, um, the controlling of the musical textures. And uh, so probably in my pedagogy practice, that so the lessons from synesthesia, what um, I, I use in my teaching, so it's visualization of musical texture. So. Um, which which relies um, uh, again on perception on perception of time and maybe later I detail in detail I will show in my PowerPoint presentation so we can just yeah. Mm -hmm. But is music perception innate or is it uh, let's say culturally acquired? Um, uh, it's both because uh, you see that so human beings we are products of society and culture and there uh, so it's there uh, as well it's subjective experience of music but as well it's cultural experience and there uh, i think um it's amazing um that we have such a diversity of cultures and the um different backgrounds and how music formed in, with different nationalities and the uh, uh, different traditions, cultural traditions. Mm -hmm. Is there any relationship between music and language? Uh, yes, it is. Music itself is a language. Uh, if we first uh, if we think about syntaxes, so music as well as language has phrases and sentences. But what is even more important for performer, for example, all music phrases, it's perceived actually physically because we, we speak them in our mind as we perform. And as well, like I teach my students to put it on their length of the breath. So if you want to say something, the melodic phrase, so you put it on the length of, of the breath and that allows you natural um, natural flow in music because we we don't exist without body we exist in the body and the, so the music perception has to be natural according to our physical abilities of perception and acoustics mm -hmm. do we know if there are any developmental stages in music learning or music or acquiring musical ability um, um, of course, is it so, okay, probably okay, developmental stages in music learning. Um, I suppose it's uh, like what you mean, it's when the child starts to learn music. So yes, music memory develops um, is it so, and then it's richer and richer experience. First, it's probably basics that so that we do like music, but then so is it intellectually you grow what is there and the symbols of uh, music language um, make more sense and more appealing to the um, physical system and as well as it's so intellectually as you like as we know more about music so and yes probably it is very important for children to start earlier so that maybe around five or six even pre-instrumental lessons and even earlier Kadai system introduces children very early stage even like through singing that so with mother and the child in the group like 
age three years old because the uh, children perceive it more naturally than it's like a language and then it's music is forever easy for them because they they have this inner experience of uh, natural learning not logic learning yes mm -hmm. Uh, in what ways does music relate to emotion? Um, okay, so basic level. So we all know that so the major chord, um, happy, so minor chord, um, sad. So there's mysteries in music and the music such a complex. Um, it's not so basic. And honestly, the science still cannot ex explain, you know, that how the emotions triggered. Certainly, it's vibrations and frequencies. And what is interesting now, so I haven't done research, deep research in that, but digital music experimenting now a lot with frequencies. And the, there's a lot of discu discussion with 440 hertz or 432 why you know that the humans adjusted to that frequency not to different so this is still a mystery <laughs> okay is that so okay fair enough does music expertise have any sort of genetic basis um i I'm not sure about this because I'm not the, the geneticist, but what I can say in relation to synesthesia research, for example. So synesthesia is run, runs in families and it passed through generation to generation and it's actually passed certain types because uh, there's more than 80 types of synesthesia registered and it's actually so we we all born as infants in the stats. So there's research on brain imaging done in the University of Sussex, um, and the, as well as so Daphne and Charles Maurer. Uh, so infant synesthesia, the brain scan shows it's the brain is cross model till 24 months old. And of course, young children still carry this um, till probably they seven or eight years old. They have more metaphoric language and um, higher mixture of the senses, and it reflects in their language, so as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the relationship between music and consciousness? Um, so as I mentioned before, um, so uh, consciousness studies discussing now is it so to open broader area, you know, that so because music as a stimulus can enhance alternative this imaginary state of consciousness where we experience imaginary reality. So like I'm more developing the area of music consciousness where is I'm combining um, cognitive musicology together with sensory analysis and the like particularly I'm working with augmented and virtual realities to visual visualize music analysis and on the basis of archetypes of musical texture and the um, to give um, more approachable and more digestible music narrative for compositions because not Everyone has opportunity to study classical music just to make it more understandable through visualization, associative visualization and synesthesia mm -hmm. art. Mm -hmm. But uh, what does imaginary realities mean exactly? And does that tell us anything about how consciousness works? Um, um, Okay, so maybe I just, uh, so um, I quote Anil Seth, he's a neuroscientist from um, um, Cyclic Consciousness Studies Center. So he says that so consciousness, it's a hallucination of the reality we all agreed on. So 
the world is not necessarily what we perceive. Like, of course, we rely on our sensory experience. It, and even that if we experience this recognizing objects, so the brain works as a predictive machine. So based on our experience, what we gained before. So that there's, but it's again, it's a mystery. It's two scientists, you know, they're exploring that. So um, again, that it's much bigger diversity there than we probably think. Of course, it's their physical world we can touch and their sense. But if you think that now with technology, we have augmented reality and virtual reality, we actually see, so which we, before, we would say what I see, I believe, but it's enhanced digital realities. So it's, it's very exciting times when we considering all these new concepts. Mm -hmm. But do the states of consciousness produced by music and other forms of art differ essentially from normal quote-unquote consciousness? I think that so there's many programs now developed uh, like music therapy, art therapy. It does something when we um, put ourselves in this creative state, it calms the mind and opens, um, it gives such a relaxation uh, to the whole system to attach actually from the uh, basic, you know, things, okay, I have to go to the shop, like I need to do all this, or problems overloading me, so that the, so I think it's, um, so this is alternative state of consciousness we all should balance in our life and uh, um, embrace the, this experience to balance the, the, the system. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you've already mentioned synesthesia. Are there different types of it? Yes, uh, so that we have a global uh, international network um, that so uh, by according to Sean a day, so there's more than 80 registered types and there, so it's, um, uh, so like I mentioned, a couple of, literally every country now has synesthesia association, okay? So the big one, uh, American Synesthesia Association, President Carl Steen, so they started 20 years ago, and the Spanish Articita Maria Jose de Cordoba Serrano, then uh, James Warnerton in UK, so then we have Canadian Synesthesia Association, so like all this network exploring and adding to the research that so how many times but I mentioned probably just some of them because as I said you see that so the baby is born we all born in the multisensory cross modal brain infant synesthesia so uh, I mentioned you know some uh, some types people actually experience but they're not aware that it's called by this word for example mirror touch synesthesia uh, some people have such a high sensitivity, they cannot watch medical operations because the tactile sensation what they see on screen projects to their skin and it's overwhelming experience. They feel the cat what they see that they are happening. So not many people are aware that this is actually synesthesia. Or for example, children could be in schools, you know, that the teacher shows letter A red color but the child experiences it in yellow so that's why all this network you know this is color graphene synesthesia we trying to bring you know bigger awareness in the schools and the, um that it, to general populations it's so that people won't experience um sometimes trauma from like I'm not understood in this world because like I see this letter in a different color, so which is allowed. <laughs> is, it so? mm -hmm. is there any relationship between synesthesia and creativity? Uh, yes, it's the, um, okay, the scientists, they look at this as when they do 
testing or experiments, you know, inviting people to participate in questionnaire. So people who are more creative and already in arts and music professions, they they more approachable, they would be keen to go to, to do this. And then the statistics will kind of have, um, you know, that so in, in their favor. But uh, Ramachandran and Hubbard, the neuroscientists, uh, they actually said that, and I would like to read this quotation. So they said, they said is that synesthesia causes success communication among, among brain maps. Depending on where and how widely in the brain the trait was expressed, it could lead to both synesthesia and to a propensity towards linking seemingly unrelated concepts and ideas, in short, creativity. So certainly the multisensory network of the brain probably gives more enhancements to to relate unrelated concepts and then so that to bring some new impressions. Mm -hmm. Maybe is it so that, um, what do you think that maybe I just move to my slides? Uh, yeah, yes, if you want, if you and think it's, the... yes, if you think this is a good point to go there, yeah. Mm. So I just share the screen that, um, so um, I just they give more in more detail and maybe just show a couple videos, you know, that so um, it, so it's different slides from different presentations, you know, that so um, this is just a summary of what I do, that so and some statements. So I will uh, introduce refer that to a cognitive musicology analysis and as well as it's a um, 4D computational model of musical synesthesia. Um, so um, as well as it, so I just mentioned that we uh, usually produce some projects for Brain Awareness Weeks and uh, I got some awards from um, European Neuroscience uh, Federation that's so brain research. So um, um, yes, exciting opportunities with augmented realities. So here this is um, just maybe not many people maybe know that so what is, oh, I skipped. So, okay. And then, so, yeah. So I press play. So this is synesthesia art by Timothy Layden. So all this additional information um, about music, you know, visualization of structural visualization or associative, we can actually now implement in music listening through augmented and virtual realities. So there, there, I had a long road <laughs> to. <laughs> to the concept what I have now. And this is just a map of my PhD dissertation when uh, it was really interdisciplinary. I had to go from performing analysis, you know, to historical research, reception, music consciousness, and there, so technology as well. That um, So we talked about synesthesia. Here is example. So Nin Hui Xiong, he has musical space synesthesia and as well, chromesthesia type and he painted on my performance of Chopin ballad. Um, now that so that the, I did music analysis so here is it's the colors reflect on the score it's not um, it's just to differentiate um, the, the layers of musical texture because I don't have chromesthesia type for me their sound is a sculpture my type is musical space synesthesia so I play it's in next slide is better mm -hmm. Ooh.
so what I wanted to say is that you see this visualization influencing time perception and it's actually I have to say is that I use you know this in my pedagogic practice uh, for my students and the, it's uh, just when you give more time and uh, so to uh, to um, the acoustics happening and the complex of uh, the musical texture hap to, to happen and then uh, the results are is effortless playing and virtuosity so when they allow necessary time for the music to happen you know that if it's a complex there so um, I came to this conclusion not only <clears throat> just by my pedagogic practice, but there was historical research, like uh, on composer Sinestet and his perception, um, and the, so, like I have hypothesis, he had a musical space synesthesia. So I just move further. The so two, like um, I um, introduced the music consciousness studies. So with this composer in relation to collective consciousness, because this is what he tried to convey in his music and to uh, to develop um, um, complex harmonies which would reflect uh, on this um, consciousness state. Um, not simple emotions of joy or sadness, but um, something um, more spiritual, I would say. So <clears throat> here. Um, so, Scraven Sinister, how is it the, his mentality of. Um, so, now it's my <laughs> line reflected in his compositions. So, is it in Poem of Fire, he inserted additional. Um, line for the color organ and he created a map uh, of um, emotions and colors according to tonalities. So the Vanishkina and Galeva they recorded it by the score of Prometheus. It's a uh, uh, Scriabin was aware of Blavatsky's secret doctrine where she revealed as a connection between colors and their uh, perception and sound vibrations. So Scriabin believed that so the sound frequencies can influence consciousness. Right. Uh, okay. So um, here is it. So his harmonic system, uh, big complex. So it's dual modality mode. For example, when I did analysis, imagine combination. So or C major and F sharp major. So it gives twelve semitonal mode scale. Um, so which is as well symbolic okay so and as well that so i just briefly mentioned that so his prometheus mystic chord and in general chords he bases on the forces not triads as normal so what effect it gives by the sound so the chord based on forces it's a dissonant chord so it's altered dominant chords so in the classical harmony, they should be resolved, but he places them in a row and it gives such a dazzling effect. Absolutely, it doesn't give the sense, oh, we have to resolve. No, it's just this state, probably continuity or just absolutely different effect. So, um, yes, that's um, here's it. So, this is my own painting. Um, so I can play sample just so that mm -hmm. people yeah. Thank you. 
So and the, here is it. So, so I work in collaboration. Uh, oh, due to the again. lack of time, I will. Uh, I won't go through uh, five preludes of Opus seventy four. But the concept is um, the same. So I just one skip this. Uh, okay, so I just mm -hmm. show um, okay. the map of um, how is it. So I work with artists on visualization, and this is music analysis based on archetypes of musical texture for cognitive musicology visualizations. And I hope in the future, so it would be implemented in virtual reality. So um, here's it's a tear. So it's a combination. So we had the historical images of uh, artists uh, as Rubel and the uh, Delville that so uh, Scriben used his um, um, drawing for Prometheus score cover. So and then Sinistead art by Timothy Layden and my art. So there's um, our symbolic archetypes of Scriben is probably too deep. <laughs> That's so but. Uh, um, so that the um, I, I skip don't have that. Time to so it's all at like on my YouTube channels and Vimeo, but I probably I will show you like recent work we did um, uh, with uh, okay so that's on my music analysis, Timothy Art. Uh, Timothy Layden, he painted uh, archetypes of musical texture, and the uh, Maura McDonald she did animation from this, and it's on list B minor sonata. Okay. So. Okay, so uh, the recent research, uh, I'm working in collaboration with the Haunted Planet Augmented Reality Development Studios, Director Professor Matt Hacker, Trinity College Dublin, and we have now three projects. So, um, Synesthesia Gallery, Augmented Reality, so where it's collective experience of 15 multisensory soundscapes, so art and music. So then, it's psychogeography with Jack um, Yates, a um, symbolist, um, Irish symbolist um, artist. So, and the Alice Dali augmented reality experience. So, uh, Salvador Dali painted 12 chapters of Lewis Carroll, um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. So, this is very exciting. It's uh, for the last two psychogeography with Jack Yates and Alice Dali experience. It's me composing on art. Um, that we just waiting for copyrights images. You see, art societies. Irish, Spain, it doesn't matter where, they still very cautious to release copyrights because, you know, digital world, it's a new, new concept and consciousness. So that's so that's why it takes time. It's it's long time. But this is very exciting projects. Um, um, yes, I think, you know, so, so um what else so this is my publications and like contacts you can find me on twitter so that's my academic research so thank you so much um uh, yes if, if you have questions so that uh, please yeah we 
that. Uh, yeah, perhaps just two or three questions before we finish. Uh, so uh, j just to be clear, we can use synesthesia to facilitate learning in the domain of music, correct? Mm, interesting question. You see that so there's um, there was carried research in Sackler Consciousness Center, okay, by Bohr and Anil Set, like his team. So um, the question was: Can adults be trained? To synesthesia, so artificial induced synesthesia. So during six weeks, they introduced people and they trained their memory to perceive um, letters uh, and shapes in color. So to induce calligraphy and synesthesia. So and what the findings was, it is increasing the memory and their uh, mental abilities. So synesthesia model could be a tool to to activate the plasticity of the brain and the, to increase mental abilities. So this induced synesthesia won't necessarily last, you know, lifetime, but by this experience and by the experience of multisensory design and their uh, music art programs using this model, Perhaps it open people to imagination and the diversity of perceptions. That's probably the goal of the research. Mm -hmm. So uh, when it comes to developing virtual reality and augmented reality systems, uh, I mean, what would be their purposes here? Um, it's amazing tools <laughs> for actually to capture imaginary world and to give, um, for example, with psychogeography, so we augment in locations uh, of mobile applications, segmented reality, so to see that so in your own park, to augment it with art and music soundscapes. And of course, and virtual reality, it's, um, it gives opportunity, not just listening music, but experiencing and I think it's very exciting tool for education in general imagine that so a new generation would experience would experience geography or history for example experience not just learning in the books you know so um, it is exciting opportunities um, here mm -hmm. so just one last question then uh, do you know if music has or could have any sort of mental health applications? I think so. Um, it's uh, just another form of, it, it, there's um, Sarah Lazar did a research on um, the impact of meditation on gray matter of the brain. So music and arts, it's just another form of meditation which suitable for some people prefer meditation some people prefer art some people music but it's a necessary activities for our human being expression and creativity and something we embrace for our imaginative world mm -hmm. very well so i think at the end of the presentation you already left us with the places on the internet where people can find you and contact you. So, Dr. Rudenko, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Very welcome. <laughs> Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button, all of those things you already know. And please consider supporting the show either on PayPal or Patreon. All of the links will be in the description box of the interview starting at $1 per month. So it would be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga, Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, 
Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Ginty, Zurtger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbo, George Spinha, Phil Kavanagh, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dremiti Grigoriev, Diego Lanonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Simon Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy and Trader in NYC, My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vangnagdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardus France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.